So thank you very much for being here. Uh, we have a number of events uh, coming up uh, before our season uh, comes to a close in June, though there, there's some shushoting about even events in, in July, if, if not August. So uh, that, that's a, a sign of, of good um, vitality as well. I, I want um, first to tell you about the, in chronological order, the next event, and that is on uh, May the 9th. I'm not going to actually tell you much about it, but I'll tell you about the person who's going to tell you about it, and that, that is Diane Tisdall, and she is just doing a, a great job for the CIC and, and for you. Um, you know, we've worked hard to have a good cross-section of the population, so younger people just leaving... Um, University of Ottawa and the Norman Patterson School, including some undergraduates, a mid-career group, and then the other members that, that we're perhaps more uh, familiar with. And Diane Tisdall is our, one of our two vice presidents and um, leads our youth team. She also has another hat um, as, as president of a, a group that we're affiliated with called The Panel. Uh, and she currently works at Global Affairs uh, and the G7 and G20 file. So I'm going to just stand aside for a second, Diane, and you tell us about the, the upcoming event. That'd be great. Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, so our next event is on May 9th. Um, it's at the beautiful Sir John A. Macdonald Building on Wellington, recently renovated. And we're discussing Canada's role in the global arms trade. So it's a very timely and important subject. Uh, we're a group of young professionals that are putting on a cocktail reception at 5 p.m. on Monday. Uh, and we have Steam Whistle Brewery, um, who is sponsoring us. And then at 6.30, we're having an excellent debate moderated by Hannah Thibodeau from the CBC. And she'll be moderating an excellent group of panelists. Uh, we have Adam Taylor, who was the senior advisor to Ed Fast when the big arms trade deal was signed in 2014. Uh, we have Besma Mamani from CG, who works on Middle East issues. And we have Monia Mazik, uh, who is a human rights activist. And we're also lucky to have Stephen Chase, who is from the Globe and Mail, uh, who is an expert on this file um, and will bringing, be bringing his wealth of knowledge. We often sell out our events, um, so we'd love for you to buy tickets early. You can find them on thepanelonline.com. Um, and it comes with complimentary canapes and an excellent debate and, of course, steam whistle beer. Um, and we're very lucky um, to have the CIC and Nipsia sponsoring us. Um, I'll be here throughout the evening if you'd like to discuss it further. But it's on Monday at uh, the Wellington, on Wellington at the Sir Donny McDonald Building. Thanks. This will be, I think, their fifth event. They, they normally have about 300 people, CPAC coverage like we have tonight, um, and a, a, a very a lively sort of uh, early mid-career group uh, to which the, all the young at heart are, are uh, welcome. Our, our next um, event in our, our monthly uh, series, uh, we, we do our best to do these every month, but, but given the availability of Lord Owen and also of... Uh, the Honourable Bill Graham, we, we are privileged to have uh, uh, Mr. Graham speaking on Wednesday, May the 18th, about his new book. Uh, and Don Newman will be uh, playing a role similar to what we'll see Jeffrey Simpson playing tonight of, of engaging uh, Mr. Graham in that discussion. So uh, Bill is the, uh, the chair of the CIC in Canada, so an important event uh, for us that we're very much looking forward to. And then uh, our final uh, monthly event for the year is with Ambassador Bruce Heyman. This will be one of the first times he's returned to the public stage. It's something that an American ambassador historically always does, uh, comes to speak to the uh, Canadian <coughs> National Council in Ottawa. And on that evening, David Halton will engage uh, with Ambassador Heyman. So we look forward very much to that on Thursday, June the 9th. Uh, and we'll have our annual general meeting before that at about 4 o'clock. Now, concerning tonight, we, we have a bookseller arranged from London uh, through uh, Perfect Books on Elgin Street. And uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Owens, like one, one of your honorifics, uh, uh, books will, will be available there. Uh, um, the book that he's going to speak about tonight, and then, as you know, he's, he's written many other books. So he, the, you could have bought the book before and also for, for 20 minutes after the event tonight. And, uh, and uh, 
and Lord Owen would be, be happy to sign your, your copy for you. Um, nous avons ce soir la CPAC, so CPAC is with us. Um, that normally means we stick to a pretty tight uh, 90 minutes, uh, and uh, Lord Owen will uh, deliver remarks, and then uh, Jeffrey Simpson and I will take the stage with Lord Owen, and uh, I, I'm sure you know that, that uh, Jeffrey in his columns, if you follow them reasonably closely, sometimes writes on, uh, on matters that, uh, that Lord Owen uh, it will be considering tonight, so I think that will be a very interesting engagement. So I will tell you a, a, for a moment about Lord Owen, who doesn't need very much introduction in an audience like this. He is one of the UK's most distinguished political figures and public intellectuals. He is a former UK foreign secretary, an EU peace negotiator in the former Yugoslavia, so been deeply involved in the EU, to which he is going to engage us tonight as well. Uh, interestingly, um, David Owen was a neurologist before becoming a Labour member of Parliament. He left the Labour Party to become the co-founder of the Social Democratic Party, and as you re may remember, I think I was just old enough to, to be aware of what that meant, actually in British politics, changing the face of politics in that country. That's, that in a country like the United Kingdom is, is not an insignificant thing to do. So uh, it's where we have a, a piece of, of, of uh, uh, reality of the debate in, in the UK, but also an important historical figure in, in, the, in the development of politics uh, um, in the UK. He's the author of over 20 books um, where he's brought to bear his expertise as a neurologist, looking at the hubris syndrome, for example. He sits as an independent social democrat in the the House of Lords and was recognized today in the Senate, so that all seemed to be very sensible that, uh, that a member of the House of Lords would meet with the Speaker of the Senate and uh, Peter Harder and so on, so it was a, a pleasure being with you uh, during that uh, process. When we do come, uh, all three of us, to the stage, we'll also, as I say, have Jeffrey Simpson with us. Um, Simpson, as you know well, is the Globe and the Mail's uh, national affairs columnist. Uh, he's the author of eight books and has won all three of Canada's leading literary prizes. So I would call on Lord Orne to uh, take the podium. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great opportunity for me to try and talk to Canadians about the very extraordinary situation we're in with this referendum in the United Kingdom. So I, I would, of course, express my views, but uh, that's not really my prime purpose. Uh, there are no votes in this room, I don't think, <laughs> at least. <laughs> but I think there is need for understanding, and that's really why I want to come to it. In 1962, when I was uh, a junior hospital doctor, uh, I watched on television Hugh Gateskill, who was then the leader of the Labour Party, sadly never became Prime Minister, but eminently suitable to be so. And he was responding to a television broadcast by Harold Macmillan the night before, saying that Britain was going to apply to be a member of the then uh, European Economic uh, Arrangement, which always called in Britain the common market. And Gaitskill said something very important, I think. He argued that European unity was a very good idea. He had himself had spent quite a lot of time in Austria, the time when fascism was beginning to grow in the 30s. And he was a very definite European in all respects. But he had just been talking with uh, Monet, the uh, French intellectual, in many respects, the main driving force of the creation of the European project, uh, building on the Euro iron and steel community, which came eventually to fruition with six countries starting up uh, in 1956. Now, Gateskill said this, basically. If this project is going to pursue a European Union, in which Britain will just be a, another state or province in Europe, rather like Florida or California, then that has huge implications for us in this country. 
and I, as leader of the Labour Party, would resist it. But if it is a way of getting closer to a European states, working in harmony and peace, but on a consensus basis, rather like the structure of NATO in its decision making, then it's something I would warmly welcome. Now, always at the heart of the Treaty of Rome, if we're honest about it, there is an inherent tension between those people like Monet who were convinced that out of this process, and it was going to be a long process, there could emerge a United States of Europe, and those who believed that it would not. And it, that tension is reflected in the Treaty of Rome. There are some parts of it which are undoubtedly Federalist in its intention and in its design. There are other wording which says that uh, it's just a union of the peoples of Europe. And then we also had, of course, President de Gaulle coming in to power very soon after it had created and basically making absolutely clear that he was not under any circumstances going to go for the integrated model of the United States of Europe. And he demonstrated the Fouché report and various other methods and the empty chair policy. I only say this, there was a legal basis for him and indeed, very cleverly, Adenauer went along with this actually. But Adenauer was always working him, sucking him in towards the end of his period he was much more European. He was utterly hostile to it. And he had basically spiked and got the French Assembly, even though he was not yet back in power, to kill off the idea of the European defense community, which had been running in the early 50s and was re uh, its ratification was rejected uh, in 1954. Now, I give all this history because I believe this is what we are now at a crunch point, and certainly for British membership. Do we go along with the United States of Europe? Are we prepared to put, as Gatesfield said, a thousand years of history? And it's not totally surprising that inside Britain there is, in the polls, a gender difference. I'm not sorry, a gender difference, an age group difference. The younger people are more keen on this project than the older people. But the older people are more determined that it shouldn't happen than the younger people. So there's a difference, and this is reflected in the polls. And at the moment, as I speak to you, nobody knows. This is much too close to call. That may not last. It could change. And I don't think it's any of us know which way it's going to go. So that's the background. Slowly, I think, we have seen this evolution of Europe towards a United States of Europe. And those who always believe that that was the evolution of it uh, can rightly claim uh, that they were right. I've been a very strong committed European in my past history. I'm not going to go into it endlessly, but I mean, I did. I was one of the six, with 68 other Labour MPs that voted to go in against a three-line whip in 71. I resigned with Roy Jenkins, having argued that we should accept a referendum in the he made a very passionate argument, which has been shown to be pretty correct. He said, David, it's a lot easier to win a referendum when you're in uh, than rather than when you're on the out. And that uh, keep a hold of nurse for fear of getting wor something worse, an old uh, nursery rhyme, is true. The status quo is safer. And we're seeing that now, of course, in this referendum. But I only say this, that um, then again, when the th third crunch came over Europe, when the Labour Party in 1980 passed a resolution which was to come out of the European uh, community, as it was then called, without even the referendum Labour had first introduced in 1975, struck me as quite outrageous plus a few other major differences, and we created the SDP. But going back into this history, so you've seen an evolution, common market, referendum, endorsing it in 1975, and I think many people felt that Edward Heath had shown courage in forcing it through in Parliament, but he'd never got the full-hearted consent of the British people, which he'd said was necessary, 
But after that referendum, we did get it. Referendums are strange animals. Certainly in Britain, they are only used, really, when the political parties are divided, or we've used it to deal with regional issues or national issues like Scottish and uh, Welsh uh, legislative devolution. And the reason is very simple. I mean, after all, on the 23rd we vote of June, on the pretty soon after, we may well face a bill in Parliament, and I certainly hope we do, which will ask us to take enabling powers to break the 1972 Communities Act, which allowed legislation to be made in Brussels through the European uh, Parliament and through the Council of Ministers. And that is a very big break in our history and a big change back. It is reversion, if you like. Now, sovereignty matters to some people. It matters less to others. It is not, for me, the fundamental reason why I am here. Sovereignty, I argued in the 71 debate, is conceded in part as membership of the European Union and always was. And it is interesting that Margaret Thatcher, one of the people very against European integration, um, conceded more qualified majority voting in the middle 80s because she wanted the single market and she could see that you could not get coherence across what were then uh, nine countries and then 15 uh, without a mechanism and also a single commissioner who would negotiate on trade matters. So this community phase, which I think is the first and successful phase, begins in 1956 and in my view it ends in 1992 with the Maastricht Treaty. And during all of this time, I broadly speaking lived with the odd areas of disagreement, the odd things that I didn't like, but I was content to be in it, enthusiastic to be in it. And when the call came to go and spend three years of penal servitude in the Balkans as the negotiator, which I did, I never resented it and I in fact enjoyed it it's a limited way. I mean, it's the most horrendous job. F greatly helped by having Cyrus Vance as the UN representation. But I, I felt it was a sort of payback time, really, for the European Union. And I was still able to be enthusiastic. But as soon as the European currency as an issue was put on the table in 1990, I began to move into a dissenting phase. And I believe then, and I believe now, that this was an experiment. And it has been tried before, but has never worked. And there is no history of a single currency being successful without a single country. And people have tried and hoped it would work. And what has happened is either the currency has collapsed or the countries have merged. That is broadly historically correct. So I was very strongly uh, supportive of John Major in opting out in the negotiations, and he was greatly helped by Chancellor Cole, who made it possible for Britain. And, and I still hoped through the early part of the 1990s that maybe this experiment could work. I convinced myself, if you like, which it is true, that this is a unique organization, what we've been trying to build in Europe, a mixture of the supranational and the intergovernmental. But all the time, and particularly post-Maastricht, Maastricht was founded on a French politician's compromise of a pillared approach. And they would actually, they built these and designed these pillars into the Maastricht Treaty, which were clearly intergovernmental and clearly supranational. And defense and foreign policy was clearly uh, intergovernmental. Now remember the history of the Bundesbank, totally opposed to this euro, argued that its design was flawed right from the start, and it wasn't just wanting to hold on to the Deutsche Mark, they actually didn't believe in it. And it was forced through by Kohl, a very strong chancellor, and encouraged greatly by Mitterrand, who believed that Germany was building its strength up, and that uh, it would be very helpful to France to have this arrangement made. So 
the Treaty of Maastricht came in. In retrospect, Britain should have done what de Gaulle did over defense. We should have vetoed it. I have no doubt about that, but I didn't think it at the time. Then you come to a little bit of signs of it not working. I have a house in Greece. I built it, designed it. I love the place. And uh, I was asked to go down to Athens for a conference in the latter part of the 1990s on this whole question of the Eurozone. And I twice did it. And I twice begged the Greeks not to touch it. And we now know, of course, that they only went in through uh, courtesy of Goldman Sachs and a fixed deal and rigged financial figures. And all through the history of the Eurozone, there's been this problem. If they had started with the Benelux countries, modestly, six or seven, built it up very, very slowly, maybe still this experiment could work. But we had, of course, the global crisis starting in 2008. By 2009, Greeks was in crisis. By 2010, the Eurozone was in crisis. Now, I'm not going to quote any figures because I'm trying to keep my comments short. But go and look at the source of some of the people who've grappled with the Eurozone. Geithner, uh, Obama's first Secretary of the Treasury, has written an extremely good book, Stress. And he makes it clear that as they were dealing with the global crisis, the Eurozone crisis was dragging them down, and he couldn't get them to make reforms. And he made the very simple point that it is absolutely essential that if you're going to run this Eurozone, there has to be fiscal transfers from the poorer parts of the Eurozone, uh, from the richer parts of the Eurozone to the poorer parts of the Eurozone. And you all do it, you do it here in this country. You help those parts of Canada which are not so financially well off, to make it possible to run a single currency. You have run a single currency alongside this massive border with the United States of America. I don't know what the history would have been if you'd gone for the dollar as your currency. I personally think you would have eventually merged. And I think you have been able to establish your independence and to the great uh, uh, strengthening of uh, Canada. So we come to this new phase, really, which is from 1990 when the talk began. Yes, there had been discussions about monetary union before. Very difficult experiments. We went through a thing called the snake collapse. We went through the thing called the European monetary system and the exchange rate mechanism collapsed. And we'd had ample signs that this was going to be very difficult to do. Another book to look at, if you want to make your mind about this, has just come out recently from the former governor of the Bank of England. Uh, it has this wonderful word in its title, alchemy. I love it. I described myself, it, I don't know, I used to talk about hubris and uh, out of control and all this thing. Now I only talk about alchemy in connection to the financial world that landed us in this global mess in 2008. And if you're asking yourself about what's happening about Trump, and you're asking what's happening about uh, Marine Le Pen in France, and even to some extent perhaps our own UKIP, although I think it's rather different, you look at the disillusionment in the world outside at what has been happening through the financial crisis and the feeling of a growing group of people who feel alienated, disenchanted, disillusioned, and completely untouched by a, an elite that is rich, self-satisfied, and has not taken enough notice of the problems of those people who have been hit by the global crisis. We have a biggish problem in Europe over the Eurozone, and a lot of it is, you know, Spain, 54% unemployment in the under 25, still very high, and going and staying high for a long, long period of time. Now, this isn't just the problem of the Eurozone, it's the problem of austerity uh, policies, the inability to live with uh, uh, debt, and this virtue seen in everybody prescribing a legislative commitment that you couldn't go into debt. Well, it's, it, it seems to me to be coinciding with this basic maldesign of the Eurozone. So, 
we come to it. I went to Berlin in January, and I wanted to see, was there any chance that the Eurozone could reform itself quickly? And I left, I went with David Marsh, the author of the best books on the Euro, and if you want to read its history and other things, I strongly recommend that too. And we both came away convinced that the earliest, the earliest, the European Union might go through all the hoops of treaty amendment and changes and introduce proper fiscal transfers would be 2023. 2023, in 2016. And then possibly it would be delayed till 2025. And some realists said, you know, I'm not even sure we'll do it then. We'll only do it in a crisis. Well, Mervyn King, the uh, former governor of the Bank of England, whose book is Alchemy, he says this, and Mark, as my teacher used to say, and inwardly digest. The euro is going to go on in crisis. The euro will collapse unless Europe creates for its eurozone a country called Europe. Now that, in my view, does not mean the euro would go. I don't think a country as strong and as well-governed as Germany that goes through all this trauma of giving up the Deutschmark is going to easily give up the euro. And a grouping on basically Benelux will, I think, survive with the euro. And I go further. The friendship and the uh, unity and the melding together ever since the European Coal and Steel Community, that's occurred at civil servant level, exactly what Monet wanted to, incidentally, between France and Germany, I think he's strong enough, to probably, though not so easy as it would have been, say, two years ago, three years ago. I mean, the growth of uh, uh, alternative Deutschland, which is the new party, makes it much harder. But I still think it's very likely that Germany will be prepared to help finance France, and there'll be fiscal transfers which involve German and Dutch money going to France. But they will not do it for Italy. They will not do it for any of the dis undisciplined countries as they see it at the Mediterranean. And so it will be a different shape and a much smaller euro if it does survive. So what does this then all mean to Britain? This issue would have been difficult enough. But something else, and in my view, more sinister, because I think it is based not on idealism, but on crass uh, nationalism, and what I call presentism and pretension. The building up of a European defense force while we have already within our midst the most successful command and control procedure for military operations that has ever been invented in NATO. It dealt with the Woodrow Wilson problem by having SACA in European and not in European hands, but Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, with an American general or admiral, has meant that the Americans are ready to work within this structure and allow subsidiary commanders to command American troops and American armed forces. And ever since it was created in 1949, it and it alone has been responsible for the Berlin Wall coming down militarily, and it, and it alone, in my view, has produced the stability on which a lot of the prosperity of Europe has come. And to threaten this with the indulgence of creating another military advanced center has been criticized by every single American Secretary of State that has written a book, and the most recent one is Gates. And they warned and warned in the Maastricht Treaty, we had first this word common defense. Then Chirac and Blair went off to St. Malo and introduced autonomous defense. And the Americans said, whatever you do, do not create two structured command centers, one EU and one NATO, with the same people committed to both. So you just pay jiggery pokery with the actual numbers. And this is exactly what we have been doing, progressively and systematically, and now, only a few days ago, the Financial Times had an article about a defense, European defense white paper, which has been held back because of the British referendum, 
which in my view is the defining moment when we are going to see a direct challenge to NATO. And this has pitched me absolutely firmly over because I think there's actually a British role. I think we should get out of the European Union and that means getting out of the European common and foreign security policy. And it means getting out of this pretense of European defense and having a European voice, which must spend more money, which make far greater commitment than we have done. Obama was right to say to uh, David Cameron, whether he was right to reveal it in an interview at Atlantic Magazine, maybe it's slightly different. <laughs> he apparently said, if you do not live up to the Newport commitment two and a half years ago of 2% on GDP, that would be a challenge to the special relationship. I think he's absolutely right. And I do think when he says of us Europeans that we've been freeloaders on NATO, he is correct. And I do think it is ludicrous that America is paying 73 to 75% of defense budget. If I thought that there was a remotest possibility of this European defense being built up to be a credible force that would make uh, Putin hesitate, for example, to doing hybrid warfare as he first developed in Georgia, then went into Ukraine, and now would take in, given half a chance, into any of the three Baltic states. I would have perhaps to eat my words. If they do it and do it successfully, I will eat my words. But at this moment in time, to put at risk, in, with American public opinion already beginning to question this very seriously, so here in Canada, I say two things. I believe it is vital that Britain gets out of that structure, puts a wholehearted commitment into NATO, and for the next 10 years is ready to champion in Washington the necessity of America staying. Now, I know you can spend too much time on history, but it is a fact that the Americans did not come into the Euro first Europe war, world war until the spring with troops on the ground, the spring of 1918. And they didn't come into the Second World War, even though having a very strong president who wanted to come in and do more until they were attacked in Pearl Harbor in December 1941. And Truman was bringing the forces back out of Europe in 1946. And then he had the courage to effectively go against his Secretary of State to see what was happening in the build-up of the Soviet Union, to sense what Stalin was up to, and to sp stop American troops coming back. Ever since, it's been one of the great acts with the Marshall Economic Plan uh, that they have been ready to stay there and make a judgment that it, Europe needs the stiffening of the two Atlantic partners in NATO United States and Canada. And then here's where you come in. I don't rate, I'm not going to spend my time telling you the budget is so important. What is important is you use your closeness to America, both geographically and in friendship terms, to indicate that this is not a time to get rid of NATO. This is not a time to diminish NATO. This is a time to stand firm on NATO and not listen to too much from the French who have always wanted to build this alternative up. I'm not going to decide their motives. The, the motives of General de Gaulle were very obvious and clear uh, when he started to show some interest in this late in life. But it's, uh, in my view, a moment of choice. Now, some will say, well, stay in the EU and do it at the same time. Maybe we could do it at the same time if we didn't also have an impending Eurozone crisis then you owe it to us, America, Canada too, to be our voice in Europe. Well, up to a certain extent, that voice is exaggerated. We are less and less influential because the direction of travel of this Europe is towards the United States of Europe. And we have uh, blocked that mechanism. Let's be blunt about it. We've done it. We've blocked it. And so it does have a democratic deficit. It isn't a democratic structure. And it does have uh, us refusing to see elected presidents of the Commission or presidents of the European Council. And we have resisted 
them having their own foreign policy, their own defense policy. We look what's happened on foreign policy. They have a diplomatic service. It's called the European Economic Action Service. It's basically a European foreign policy. We were told they wouldn't be embassies. They're now called embassies. We were told they wouldn't be called ambassadors. They're now called ambassadors. Now, it's perfectly reasonable, if you're aiming for that, that you slowly build this structure. It's, again, complete Monet tactics, complete... Uh, but we in Britain are entitled to say, look, we're not stupid. When you can see this structure building itself up, are we honestly just going to go along with it? And I think if this referendum goes, a younger generation gradually will do it. Well, okay, they must, they're part of the debate. And I will only say this, if this referendum does go that way, I do not think there will be another referendum shortly, and I don't want one. I take a view on Scotland. Remember that the Scots knew that Cameron was going to hold a referendum on Europe in 2013, a year before they had their own referendum. And they had their opportunity in that referendum. The British were fully behind it. We put legislative support. We agreed with their procedures. And if they had voted to get out, they would be out now. Now... I therefore think it's inconceivable that any government in Britain would give them another opportunity for at least a decade. They don't say it, of course, because I listened on one broadcast, which finally made up my mind that I was going to get off my... I had this ambitious idea of a three-month spell in Greece where I would <laughs> vote by post, uh, against, of course, uh, but I wouldn't get involved. And then I looked at this thing. I heard John Major, William Hague and Michael Hesseltine, all of whom I respect, they're not in my political party, but I, suspect, I respect them, saying that, threatening the country, that the Scots will go independent. Well, apart from the fact they cooked the books in their referendum, and their economic disadvantaged position now is so great, they wouldn't dream of leaving. Um, in fairness, and part of it is the oil price, but they put in a pretty enthusiastic and optimistic view of oil price. So I do not believe this is serious. And anyhow, if they want to go, let them go. There comes a point. You're not going to be have a, uh, a pistol to your head on this issue. And they won't get into, France, into the European Union. The Spaniards are not prepared to do it. They know that if they do it and agree to Scotland, that it will not be possible to hold separation of their big economic area. And they won't let it happen. Belgians are not wildly keen on it either. So... Now, I think I've gone over my time. Uh, which is, so I think I would just leave with one last sentence. That is the real decision that we're talking about. It's the juxtaposition of a whole range of issues which now mean, unless you're blind, you can see the direction of which Europe is traveling. Good luck to them. I'm not against a continental uh, union. That, incidentally, was exactly what Churchill in his famous speech in Zurich, offered. It's always interpreted in Europe that he was the first to offer the European Union of their dreams. He said there were three elements in 46. The United States and its circle of influence, the UK and its circle of influence largely on the Commonwealth, and continental Europe, which would have a European Union. There was no way of looking at his wording as being anything other than excluding the UK from it. Now, you could say we should have woken up to this a lot earlier. We shouldn't have gone into this experiment. It's obvious it was always going to happen. Well, I think we went into it for good idealistic reasons and believed and hoped that it could make sense to us. I think there was much greater risk for Britain staying in, gradually losing even more influence on the fields, probably having our people, and we'll be much more affected by a Eurozone collapse, face a Eurozone collapse, Every year we can put under our belt with a more global outlook, more global trading, difficult to do, but possible, I think, then it's easier it will be to withstand a Eurozone collapse. And for those reasons, putting your country first, which is, after all, the main task of a politician, I think it's time that we did it with friendship and left the European Union and put our effort into NATO and our effort into trying to make our economy less dependent on the European single market than it currently is.
you very much, uh, Lord Owen. There's lots to uh, to think about there. Uh, it it before I pass uh, a comment to Jeffrey, who who I know has been writes about this and and also uh, has has a lot of thoughts. Just talking to him before we we got underway tonight. Uh, it seems to me, um, Dr. Owen, that at, at some level you're saying, hey, uh, I, would, I would like uh, to see Europe as a single country. Uh, I want the euro to work. And you know what? The, the best way to realize that is to take the UK out of the equation. We're holding you back. Is that, is that part of your thinking? Yes. Uh, I think we are holding them back, and we do it in subtle ways, but I think that uh, the next steps, which will probably come with the five presidents report, which again will come after our referendum in January 2017, there will be demand supported probably by Merkel for a directly elected president of the European Commission. And I think we should just let that happen now and uh, say that is the next logical step. So, I think, yes, uh, we should... Michel Rocard, who was Prime Minister of France, we've been friends since 1966. He's a Federalist, and I'm an anti-Federalist. We've retained our friendship. We met in Paris on a public meeting of the Movement European, and we both agreed that it was time for Britain to leave. He, because we were stopping their progress, and I, who said, if you can make this work, do it. But at least we won't be blamed for making it not work. Some people say, well, we'd be blamed if there's a Eurozone crisis. Well, maybe. But if there was a Eurozone crisis, at least they would start to deal with the problems and maybe make a more successful and larger European Union than the one I've anticipated, a smaller one. Does that provide you with any segue, Jeffrey, to... Uh to um, engage at this moment? Well, I don't know if it's a segue, but I've got the microphone. You do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to first of all thank you for inviting me. Um, just a bit of history, personally, I'm sorry. Uh, when I was a graduate student in the United Kingdom in the early 1970s, um, this issue, you will remember, was roiling British politics. De Gaulle had said no some years before, and there was an active debate about whether Britain should join the then EE common market. And we North Americans uh, who uh, were at school together were following this debate and we were all slightly nerdish. And I think to a person, as I remember, we all said, get over it. You're a European country. There's no special relationship with the United States, really. The United States has many interests around the world and the Commonwealth is a vestigial organization. So accept your future, which is in Europe, which is what I think at the time you agreed to. When I went back as a correspondent in the 1980s, the man on my right gave me a wonderful narrative because he and Shirley Williams, Bill Rogers, and Roy Jenkins created the Social Democratic Party. And one of the issues that uh, galvanized them was the Labour Party's antipathy to Europe. And uh, the gang of four, as they were called, broke away and formed the SDP, and it was exciting stuff. And I might say, just being parochial for a moment, it was a good story for us because our politics is quite centrist. And so the polarization of British politics as between Labour and Mrs. Thatcher was not ours, and so these people were more our kind of folks. You know, centrists, reasonable kind of people, not ideologues. <laughs> So I always had a soft spot in my heart for Lord Owen, David Owen, Dr. Owen. Um, so I guess I've been around this issue uh, for quite some time, hence your invitation. I just want to, before I ask Lord Owen a question, read a passage, one paragraph, from a book the author of whom you know, Hugo Young, who was one of the really great columnists and journalists and authors in Britain for many years for The Guardian, and he wrote this terrific book which I pulled down from my shelves, called This Blessed Plot, which is from Shakespeare, Britain and Europe from Churchill to Blair. I think it's fair to say Young was a Europeanist, one of, them, one of those types, maybe. At any rate, this is what he wrote in his introduction about his book. This is the story 
of 50 years in which Britain struggled to reconcile the past she could not forget with the future she could not avoid. Not a bad line. It is the history of an attitude to history itself. It is a record not of triumph, but rather of bewilderment concerning a question which lay in wait throughout the period to trouble successive leaders of the nation and which latterly tested some of them to destruction. Could Britain, the question ran, truly accept that her modern destiny was to be a European country? That was written in 1998. And here we are, what is it, almost 20 years later. Those words resonate. They resonated tonight. They resonate throughout the Brexit debate. They keep resonating throughout the United Kingdom. And even if, so I'll put this question to you, even if there's a yes vote, I mean a, a remain vote, I guess you call it, will this issue that he demarcated so eloquently in 1998 go away? Will you and the Brexit people lay down your arms as you say the Scottish nationalists will throw up their arms and say it's surrender, the Spanish will never let it happen, the Belgians will never let it happen, not for another 10 years. Will you go to Greece and give it up? Well, I'm 77, so I think it's uh, not unreasonable. Um, How about the ones who were 47, 57, 67? Because they are older folks who are for this. Well, the first thing to do is to, in a way, answer your question. Uh, you're correct, everything about that. But what has happened really since you left us? I've never, I've, I've never <laughs> left you. <laughs> I've never left you. Canada never leaves Britain. Is, is the currency, because once that really happened, people like me could no longer go on arguing <coughs> there will not be a United States of Europe. And more importantly, we have always had I mean, our political leadership, closet federalists. I mean, Roy Jenkins was one. Uh, uh, Ted Heath was one. Not so closet. Uh, Tony Blair was one. And what has happened is that the people have just consistently, doggedly fought this establishment. And, I mean, all these concessions, I mean, in 1997, they were forced, John Major as prime minister, Tony Blair through sucking teeth as opposition leader, and Ashdown, the leader of the then liberal uh, Democrats, all committed to having a referendum before a euro could be introduced. It was like drawing teeth to get that commitment out of people like Michael Heseltine in the cabinet of John Major and Kenneth Clark, Chancellor Exchequer, in the Chancellor, I think. But it was done because he couldn't win an election. And the other two opposition leaders feared losing votes sufficient that they couldn't win the election without making those commitments. And there was a referendum party and a very charismatic businessman who was multi-language, spoke fluent French, lived in Paris, had mistresses in both countries. Uh, uh, de Monsieur Goldsmith. Well, Goldsmith, uh -huh. yes. His son is now standing as uh, mayor of London. Now, that went on. And then UKIP started as a party, dismissed by uh, David Cameron as fruitcakes. And they actually won. They were the largest party in the European Parliament elections. And, you know, it's, you can't go on scoffing at it. You gradually saw, as your MPs, more and more, particularly if you were conservative, more and more of your constituents and people you liked, more and more businessmen, particularly small businessmen, saying these regulations were absolutely strangling them, making it harder for them to win markets overseas. The supporters are all the bankers, the financiers, but not the head fund writers, not the entrepreneurs, and nor the small businesses. But So this, you cannot avoid the fact that here we are, level pegging in this debate. Now, some people say, well, it's all the newspapers. It is true that there are powerful newspapers and powerful newspaper bosses like Murdoch and elsewhere. But I mean, the Daily Telegraph and Sunday Telegraph group, the uh, Mail group, led by Rothermere, who's definitely a European. So it's not as simple as people making. Well, they are responding 
like most journalists and newspapers do, to their audience. Are they going to buy the paper? And they definitely think there's commercial advantage in standing on this. So it has been driven through the situation. Cameron didn't want a referendum. He had to concede it to keep his party together. Yeah, isn't this, you're an exception, maybe one, one of the few, but isn't this an internal fight inside the Conservative Party that's been going on since Labour became pro-European? Mrs. Thatcher had to deal with her dissidents. Her successors had to deal with it. Cameron's had to deal with it. And that Europe is being put through the ringer by an internal fight inside the Conservative Party. That's my first question. The second one is, I was just at a conference in Rome in which the, uh, one of the senior editors of the Financial Times reported that the public opinion data that she reported suggested that there was a cleavage, and you alluded to it, that anyone under 40, or the, sorry, not anyone, the people under 40 in the majority are in favor of remaining in Europe, and that those over 40 are in a majority against. So are you the last gasp and last guard? Is this your last chance? I think yes. I do. I, I, I personally do think that. I am not in favor of having another referendum in two or three years' time on in-out. There might have to be a referendum on joining the euro. Michael Heseltine the other day said, we will join the euro. It may not happen in my lifetime. And he's 83. So, you know, I, I, I just think that my prediction is and I say it more in sorrow than in anger, is that if the Remain win, that population of the younger group will become more and more at ease, and we will join the euro at some stage. Not before it's reformed, and that might take a hell of a long time, 10 years maybe, maybe longer than that. I want to draw you out on something you didn't speak about, but about which you undoubtedly have informed views. We went through two referendums in Canada, where everybody in the room, most everybody remembers it, and central to those referendums was, would Quebec be better off or worse off if they left Canada? So we're pretty mm. familiar with ce qu'on appelle en français la bataille des chiffres. Hein? Mm. Et pendant les campagnes référendaires au Canada, les deux côtés ont émis des rapports en essayant de convaincre la population que ça serait désastreux pour le Québec s'ils se séparaient du Canada, et pour le Québec, ça serait an avenir en or. Okay, so I under, we all understand in Canada we're pretty good at this sort of stuff. Having said that, having said that, I want to just cite these things to you. Oxford Economics did nine different Brexit scenarios, Oxford Economics out of Oxford University, known around the world. In the worst case scenario, the UK economy would be 39, 3.9% smaller by 2030. There were other scenarios where uh, the output for GDP would not decline by as much, I might say. So that was the in extremis worst case. The Treasury in the UK, you will claim that this is all propaganda, but the Treasury has its merits, I suppose, said that the analysis find, found that the annual loss of GDP per household under the three alternatives would be between 2,600 pounds and 5,200 pounds, and that depended upon whether you had an agreement like Canada, no agreement, or something like under the World Trade Organization. And the OECD, which is, I think, deemed to be pretty objective, I mean, I pay a lot of attention to it in the healthcare field that I write a lot about, just produced a paper on the ex economic consequences of Brexit in which they said, and I quote, um, uh, the, the referendum, which could lead to Brexit, would have persistent adverse consequences on economic activity in the UK and would result in negative near-term spillovers elsewhere, and went on to say that the effects would shave 3% off UK GDP, with the cost being 2,200 pounds by 2020. Your response? Well, I could just reel off a few other studies which show that the difference is sort of minus 1% to 2% uh, variation. And a lot of very distinguished economists who say, on balance, after the first three to four years of adjustment, it's perfectly possible that it will start to become a positive economic thing. I also look at the track record. Firstly, practically all those people, with very few exceptions, advocated 
euro entry for Britain and told us there were very serious consequences for Britain of not going into the euro. It would damage the city of London. It would have all these profound consequences. I was virtually uh, persona non grata in the, foreign, in the um, uh, Financial Times when I set up a group on an all-party basis in 1999 with one objective, which then linked up with Business for Sterling, to stop Tony Blair winning a referendum on what number 10 called the back of the Baghdad bounce that was going to take place in 2003 after a successful Iraqi invasion, and he would have held a referendum. He would have been very difficult to beat had we had this organization. By 2005, the battle over the euro was won. You couldn't get any British politician to admit that they'd ever been in favor of the euro. And I wrapped up the organization, and the person who'd helped me finance it said I was the first politician who had ever gone to him and told him he didn't need to spend any more money. <laughs> now, you know, it's against that sort of background that the skepticism of the average person looking at it, and you all, all these figures are growth, so it's, you're getting better, you're more prosperous, you're not getting pros prosperous so much. The unknown ailments in this, the backlash against uh, Obama's visit, for example, Perhaps, I honestly don't know, but perhaps particularly that element of over 40 who've done pretty well in Britain over the last uh, 20 years. You know, we're all in prosperous houses, you know, massive increase in property price. Perhaps they are saying that they don't mind taking a hit for a few years. Is there, <clears throat> I mean, I was there when the president was there I listened to his remarks. I watched him with the Prime Minister in their joint press conference. Why did he do what he did? Do you think he was not genuine? Do you think that the Americans, uh, that he wasn't speaking for America's true sense of Britain's vocation in Europe, that he was being disingenuous, that he had his own agenda? All the senior European leaders that I'm aware of have urged that Britain stay. Our government, although I don't think it's said it publicly, certainly privately wants you to stay. The president of China wants you to stay. Is there any world leader except for the president of Russia that wants you to leave? That last remark. Uh... <laughs> well, I'm just stating what I take to be a fact. Well, Is there one? I, I actually don't even think that's a fact. If what I think will happen if we do vote to leave it results in a strengthening of NATO, and a serious continuation of NATO for another 20 years, then I think it would be the worst possible result for Putin. So I, I take that comment, uh, even it's very frequently said, I, I, I don't think it's um, up to the level of events of, of making a decision. Russia in today is in a much different state of, to what it was under the Soviet Union. But there are still problems with it, Russia, and the annexation of Crimea is something which we ought not to allow to stay, and it will have to be negotiated before I believe we should formally recognize it. So I'm, I'm part of quite hard line on that in many respects, although I spent the last 20 years doing business in Russia. Now, I think you have to tease apart some of these issues, and firstly, there is a trade union of heads of government. They broadly take the view that you respect their democratic decisions and also the realities, the real politic of power. You do not go out and interfere in their own elections. So on almost all these issues, if there's a particular issue, you don't spend your time uh, challenging it. Now, I think I should say, I'm, I'm married to an American. She's voted for Obama twice, and I'm a considerable supporter of Obama. I think he's the most thoughtful president we've had for many years, and I think he's a success. Why did he come? I've asked myself this quite a lot. I think friendship and loyalty to uh, D David Cameron's a factor, but I think he genuinely believes it's in the American interest that Britain should stay, and I think he's damn well right. It's a very nice thing. I think he is very frightened about a global economic crisis. He came into office with one. 
He doesn't want to leave uh, in uh, January with one, and he worries that we could trigger a global economic crisis. And I can't say that it's absolutely inconceivable. I think all these governments have been playing around with us. I don't think it's the economy is anywhere near as sound as they like. I think quantitative easing is a technique. Uh, so I say to myself, I answer your question, I think he does it because of a lot of reasons, but fundamentally, the interest of the United States is in Britain going on, putting its oar in into these debates, arguing broadly what would be an American approach to these things or a Canadian approach. And uh, the others are mainly people who are just following along. Why, insult, why, when Cameron asks you to do something, why not do it? A few countries haven't done it out of perhaps old-fashioned view, you don't get involved in somebody else's elections. So I think this is not as serious. I think the earlier figures are more serious. I take them much more seriously. The economic assessment and the difficulty of getting new trading arrangements. The governments around the world, I don't think that matters tremendously. But in the end of the day, um, you know, it's all been done and, and the electorate are weighing it up. I would put a second question. There have been moments when the fear index over this election has really been quite remarkable. I mean, you, most extraordinary things are going to happen. And I've been worried about it, I don't mind saying. And I thought to myself, well, how do you explain it? And I come back to this. I almost thought at one time that the Prime Minister had nothing to do with the calling of this election, that somehow the referendum was a choice which had been forced on him. He made this choice. If there is no choice, if it's so dire, the consequences for Britain for doing this, then he should stop the referendum, change the legislation, and say he's changed his mind. If you call a referendum, you've got to do it on the basis that you think there is a proper choice, a democratic choice, and you treat your citizens with respect that is exactly what Wilson did in 1945 and Jim Callaghan. They had a preference. They told the country that they wanted to stay. But there was none of this hysterical fear. They said that, Wilson said, I will stay as prime minister. Cameron's still saying he's going to stay as prime minister. I personally hope he does stay as prime minister. But it's an extraordinary situation that we're having this referendum. And here you've got to come back to this. We've got to be very careful that we do not allow referendums to become a manipulative device, a so-called consultation. That's what brought reput the reputation of referendums into uh, disrepute, because that's how they were used in Germany by Hitler, and why in the German constitution there is no provision for referendums. The manipulative fight behind it. Now, We've had fair referendums, broadly speaking, up until now. And I think this one is, opens very serious questions about the power of government and the use of government. And that Treasury survey has been particularly one of them. If it was so dire as that, why didn't he have this reassessment, this assessment by the Treasury, before he made his decision in 2013 to have a referendum? Most businesses, before you embark on a new course, take a fundamental assessment of the options before you. And so I think that uh, I've hardened my heart to this, maybe wrongly, but I'm still a neuroscientist by training. I listen to the evidence. I've read most of those reports. I try to make up my mind. What about the great British public as they take this view? I don't know. We'll see. And I mean, it is possible that at some stage this barrage of stuff makes them really afraid and you see a sudden switch, and closer to the election, the Remain uh, vote surges up, and there's a biggish gap in the referendum choice. That is perfectly possible. I've heard you say that uh, Obama went too far by um, indicating that uh, the UK would be at the end of the queue. Um, that's sort of interesting for Canadians, because Clinton went to Montebello, which is not far from here, and, and made remarks that, that uh, had an impact on our thinking and the referendum on, on uh, Quebec staying in, as part of Canada. Oh, sorry. He did it three years after the referendum. Right. 
I had a feeling as I was saying that I was a little out of step with the, the timing. But the, the speech was very significant because he, he pronounced on uh, a, a, this issue. Um, and so Canadians uh, are used to an American president being a little bit careful, um, which is the point I really wanted to get to. Why did Obama, as you say, go too far in, in, in phrasing it that way? Well, I don't know. I would only say again, I think that um, he was so scorched by this global economic crisis, which after all came out of pretty much out of the blue. I mean, it caught the, uh, George W. Bush and Paulson pretty much by surprise. Now, um, even before Paulson, I mean, many people, the former president of the Fed, who's lauded around the world as a great uh, Federal Reserve President. I must say, I never held that view of him at all. Uh, give me, uh, um, I'm getting old these days, but the tall man. Um, I think he, yeah, uh, Volcker. I'm a Volcker man. I think he was a serious uh, chairman of the Fed. But anyhow, let's not get bogged down on why Obama did it. He's a good man. I think he did it for good motives fundamentally is there to protect the interests of the United States, and I think he did on this. I think there is an American interest in Britain sitting it out and staying there, and okay, if they take the hit uh, rather than he, why not? Uh, that's life. And there's a right, a perfectly right for Britain to say, we're not gonna take the hit, thank you very much. We've been doing it for quite a while. We've done our best to get that Eurozone reformed. We've been, George Osborne, our Chancellor Exchequer, was doing everything that Geithner is doing and now what Law is doing, trying to get the Europeans to change it. There comes a moment when you've honestly got to say to yourself again, what is the British interest? And I'm personally, in the best of my ability in the end of my life, trying to protect the British interest. Could I ask you a question about NATO, which you're a strong supporter of, and the argument that the European Union membership makes it more difficult for NATO to become stronger and for Britain to play a more active role. So I want to probe that for a moment, because I don't know how long it's been that there have been ideas for a European force. They go way back. And there have been think tanks about it, and there have been military speculations, and there have been ideas floated by the French government and the German government and, I mean, the idea has been in the air, it's been in the public domain, and as you said, it's always been opposed by the Americans. It's never gone anywhere, it's always been shot down. Now there's a new article in the Financial Times based, I guess, on an article in the German paper about a new German paper that's going to be circulated. But if the past is any guide, and, and you'll tell me whether the future will be different in the past, these ideas have floated around, never gone anywhere. They've not ever gone anywhere because there have been the Brits and the Canadians and the Americans and others who don't want that because it would pull the Americans or might pull the Americans or complicate their situation in Europe. I was just at a conference in Toronto about the future of NATO given the Warsaw Summit that's coming up and the Polish government partly organized. They certainly wouldn't favor a European force because they would, want, they would fear just what you said, that the Americans might weaken their commitment. So is this a kind of phantom that periodically appears uh, and it really isn't a serious proposition and that there's no reason that the member countries of NATO, whether they're in the EU or outside, shouldn't independently take a decision about the future of NATO and increasing defense spending, irrespective of whether there's a Euro and whether there's a European Union and whether Britain's in the Union. Where's the link between the two? Well, I think the link is, um Angela Merkel, I don't think she would agree to put out a white paper unless she thought that that was going to happen and should happen. And uh, she appointed a uh, woman with, uh, to be the Minister of Defense, many people thought might be her successor. I don't think there's, a, there's not a battle for power between these two. I think it's a genuine German wish to now go along with the French. Um, and I think it's part of the quid pro quo between the two. And the next French president will have to accept greater financial disciplines, rather like Mitterrand after the failure of socialism in one country, 
did accept financial disciplines which paved the way for the Eurozone. So I think there is a trade-off in all of this. But you see, I'm linking the two. I don't believe that the Eurozone can succeed without that democratic political ethos across it which will allow fiscal transfers. Because you're dealing with people, taxpayers' money. You're saying, we're going to put German money and Dutch money. They are already saying they won't do it without discipline. They're not going to put it into a bottomless pit because their electorate won't let them. And look at this problem. I mean, Merkel is under the same sort of pressure as we came under from UKIP. Um, alternative Deutschland is now winning elections, not winning in terms of victory, but getting it above the threshold in the landers and will undoubtedly be represented substantially, I think, you know, 10%, so let's say, in the next uh, German elections. So I think there does come a point when this direction of travel, I mean, I've given you the indications. Look at the European uh, External Action Service budget. Britain argued that it should be basically neutral. In three years, it's doubled. Uh, why are they building this foreign office? Why do you want to build all these defense forces? And there, again, you will see it, there's a difference between age groups. In almost all of these European countries, the younger people want at these sort of developments. That's why I think it is a, a threshold point for Britain. It comes a point where you have to take a stance and of course, it's easier for us to take this stance when our own electorate can see failure in the Eurozone. Wait six years and maybe some growth. And this is the way that this is thing moves. You, it's salami tactics. That's what you're up against. You, and I, ahead, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm charged by our chairman to invite the audience now. Well, no, since actually, I was going to just say you and I probably shouldn't ask too many more questions. To oh, make I it thought go you that. were going to. Well, let's ask no, but, no but more. I'm, I'm very tempted to ask one as a segue. I'm into segues. Um, uh, and that is, um, as, as Jeffrey said, I think Canadians have a certain fondness or affinity for you because of your centrist approach. Uh, it's where Canadians sort of, we had a big swing to, in one direction, but it's, it's where we tend to go back to. So there's a comfort level there. Um, I'm thinking about the fact that we have TV cameras here from, from CPAC and the great British public, the great Canadian public, at 9 o'clock on Friday night, let's say, in uh, Stratford, Ontario, or if someone's up at 3 in the morning on Sunday in Saskatoon and they tune us in, um, one, of, one of the things that they're going to have that, that af affinity and, and interest in you, uh, because I, you're fairly well known by the kind of people who would watch CPAC, I think, um, not the broader Canadian public, no offense, um, but, and I picked this up as an organizer of this event, and, 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 and this will lead to a question which I think then takes us to, to, the, to the audience as a, a way to, to the wider Canadian audience. There's a resistance to you on this issue, and I think it's, it has an emotional basis. I may be completely wrong, but too many of us have lost loved ones or memories of, love, of, of, of previous generations who went to Europe, who saw what the, the inability to, to manage Europe uh, caused, caused us in, those, in Saskatoon, in Saskatchewan. And they're going to say, explain to me, Dr. Owen, how this doesn't make my world worse because I need a Europe that is stable and in which the UK is a part of. And so I think there's an emotional reaction to, to you in Canada, and we are partly speaking to Canadians. What would your, your response be to that? Well, uh, I think it goes many ways. Many of those people came in the war to help Britain, which was standing alone against the rest of Europe. I'm very nervous about getting into this issue of the 1940 and around it. I eschew it. I think it has not much relevance to the younger people. And they've been too often said by nationalists and by far-right figures, a, a picture of the Anglosphere or the Commonwealth 
or um, patriotism. All of them are using it for their own means. I do not want to use this. I haven't raised it at all in any of the discussions I've had with you here. I don't want to make that type of appeal. We must justify ourselves before you without calling on past loyalties. You, the Commonwealth has changed. It's still valuable, but it's a very different relationship. That person who thinks that way, I think on NATO may well listen more carefully to me than possibly on the Eurozone, which doesn't matter to them. I, it is amazing, really, that people still do cross the Atlantic for that sort of thing. I think the answer to it is peace in Europe means peace in the world, probably. I mean, there are some worrying aspects of a new president of the United States thinking that they can go on controlling the South China Seas. They won't, and it could lead to a very nasty engagement and a miscalculation. But that said, global peace comes from maintaining stability in Europe. I think it wafts out through there. So I think there is a definite Canadian interest in, at fairly low price, staying part of NATO. But there are ways of using that membership. I mean, I personally believe, and have believed passionately, that the Canadian commitment to a rapid reaction force is a real factor for peace. These three, four months that I used to have to wait for a strengthening of the UN in the Balkans, for example, you wanted them there now. There are three aircraft carriers of you know, potential in Europe. Two are being built in Britain, and the French have got one. If those three aircraft carriers were put at the disposal of a UN and NATO rapid reaction force, you could always have one available on site. And in some of these countries, which are fairly close to the sea, to have a sophisticated uh, airport, effectively, where fighter planes can operate from in the hard peacekeeping missions could be tremendously helpful. So I still think that's a worthwhile project, and I could see some mechanisms. Then I was um, chairman of UCOS International, which is, was in that time the biggest Russian oil company, and in Siberia, very large. I mean, more and more people are thinking now about the Northwest Passage, and you share that with Russia, and the Arctic, and the whole things. NATO has got really quite a big, uh, most of the NATO states are the literal states. And I think this is a Canadian new and ongoing interest where just taking your Arctic in your own narrow section won't be in your interest. You've got to look at the whole of that new um, Northwest Passage as it becomes again a great, um, well, not again, but of course it, our forebears and small boats used it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think these are modern challenges where I think NATO is of relevance to, uh, uh, to Canada. But you will not get me arguing your responsibilities by going back in time, nor using what I think are old-fashioned concepts. I am a globalist. I am an internationalist. And I am a European. But I do believe this is dysfunctional. I mean, I haven't gone through all the horror stories that they tell you about regulations in the single market of business people. Why are the young entrepreneurs? Why are the small businesses? Why are they braver? They think they can go out and get these global markets. The city of London, they may have to cut their costs. The fees these guys ask. But they can go and compete with Singapore. They can go and compete with Hong Kong. And they should do so. And anyhow, probably we had too large a financial services industry. I do feel the, the spirit of merchant adventuring. We've had two great challenges to Britain when the electorate voted surprisingly, kicking Churchill out and voting for Attlee, who was, I think, now seen as a very wise decision, but nobody thought it very much at the time. When I was kicked out of government in 79 and Margaret Thatcher came in, 
I didn't relish it. I didn't think it was the right decision. <laughs> but it, it wasn't many months before I did think, actually, that it was the correct decision. And this is a third challenge. And I have, I, I'm telling you quite openly, I will accept the judgment of people. You will not have me on platforms arguing it again. If they, if they say we stay, then I think we stay, and I think the young will take us into this United States of Europe. I only hope it won't uh, suffer the same fate as the Charlemagne Empire. <laughs> There's a, a great deal of wit and wisdom in this room. And it, Barb, darling, have I got the mic? Yes. Uh, I, I guess our perspective, or my perspective, is a very different one than a, a UK or British-centric one. I look at Europe and the European Union, including Britain, but Britain not being the tail that wags the dog particularly. And I don't see a European Union that is heading towards, um, in the immediate future, um, a, a European United States. I see something that's in shambles, that's having to deal with so many issues. Uh, I hear suggestions that maybe we need a two-tier European Union, maybe a three-tier. Um, in a way, you have outliers now, Norway and so on. But I think Britain has the capacity uh, to, with its sense of governance, its sense of um, institution building over the years, that, that Britain has the capacity to be a positive, constructive player in helping build the European Union of the future. Whether it could still play that role outside the European Union, I'm skeptical. Um, I think that all Brits could be losers as a result of this. Um, I'd be interested in your comments on that. Thank you. I just want to just say that because we have limited time for questions, keep the questions short, and I won't say anything to Lord Owen about that. Okay. Well, I think we've covered it in many respects. Um, there is a judgment call here, but we do have voting records. Uh, Seventy times since Cameron's been Prime Minister, he's taken an issue to the vote, which he's indicated it matters to him, and he's lost every single one of them. So that's a factor. And, uh, you know, you are in a qualified majority voting system, and if you take that qualified majority voting, as most people think, you will eventually, in foreign policy, and then at a later stage on defense, you will find ourselves increasingly in a minority. And so, I mean, time after time after time, since 1990, all through the Blair years, quite sensible British positions were put on the table and then acquiesced in at the eventual game. So, I know it's widely held, and particularly by diplomats, but remember, the diplomatic service in Britain has been predominantly uh, federalists themselves. And they have been, I mean, I think my period as foreign secretary was the only one where the British for two and a half years were not federalists. <laughs> and I was sustained by a cabinet decision. And so the, the bureaucracy that we have in the diplomatic, not the civil service, which is different, but the diplomatic one is broadly very strongly of your view, and they think they have an influence, and they passionately believe they should stay. John? John Noble, the immediate past president of this organization and a diplomat for 35 years. I'm retired. Uh, I think Canada needs the UK in the European Union. I speak from experience because the, it was one of the means by which we were able to find out what went on in the European Union and have our view Okay, hey, we're not the United States. We can't, we can't carry the same weight. We don't carry the same club. But I want to talk about NATO. Uh, how does your withdrawal from the European Union affect your ability to influence NATO? It seems to me it would, it would take away any influence you have on this European defense project. And in fact, it would, tend, it would weaken the possibility of NATO 
maintaining these things. So I think from that point of view, leaving the European Union right now is an anti-NATO exercise. You say they'll contract, I, that's my view. Well, it's um, a position. The argument against it is, again, that um, you are losing in this debate. We have gone along with all the American Christians. We held it every bit as strongly as them. But we change our position. And then before the Treaty of Nice, there was an embarrassing situation where the British went to the Germans and to the Dutch and asked them to argue for a British position which was opposed to these changes. And they laughed them out of court. Uh, we've lost our capacity to stop these things and even our resolve to do it. I mean, they've been very slowly happening. And that is the technique of money. That is why you do this. You have to look very carefully. It means you have to study these subjects. Not many people bother. And if you approach it with just generalized views, the significant fact of it is this. I do not believe that America will change its slow move away from NATO because of European defense at this moment until they see a champion of NATO in its present structure from Europe. And the only voice there is Britain. The Danes are, by common consent, i.e. the people have told their politicians, you cannot sign up for European defense. It's not total, but they are outside European defense already. But that was not a decision of their elite. It was a decision of their people. So um, no doubt, but I mean, I can quote American diplomats, a former Kornblum, a former ambassador to Germany, who passionately thinks that Britain will be making a better contribution to NATO outside. And there are quite a number of senior generals who hold that view, and even intelligence people. But they are split too. And our problem is that, you know, they're split families, split parties. We hold different views, and yet on other things you can have great common ground. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. My name is Sam Hansen. And like John, I'm a retired diplomat, and I spent about 10 years of my career in the former Yugoslavia. And in the course of your, your talk, you had me thinking of something that one of our peacekeepers said to me in Sarajevo once, which was that he didn't know precisely what to expect when he joined the Canadian Army, but he certainly did not expect to find himself walking around a European capital with a loaded gun on his hip. Uh, I'd like you to look beyond the Brexit versus Remain question for a minute and give us your views about the future stability of Europe. Are you optimistic or pessimistic or what do you think will happen? Um, and whether people joining the Canadian Army today really should be, expect to be walking around Europe with loaded guns. Thank you. Well, um, another formative fact was the way the EU foreign policy handled Ukraine. The EU-Ukraine Association Agreement was, I think, one of the worst diplomatic documents in Europe since um, appeasement. And what happened again was pretension. Eventually, we made the right decision about Georgia and Ukraine. If we had listened to uh, those who warned earlier, Georgia was a warning sign to us. Uh, it was Angela Merkel who actually stopped NATO going in, into Georgia in, 19, uh, in 2006. In 2008, we blessed the day that we weren't being asked to uh, respond to an Article 5 demand in Georgia. We then saw the same thing develop in Ukraine. But before that, 
knowing that we were not offering NATO membership, the enthusiasts within the European foreign policy thought European defense would be the issue. And just read this. In the agreement, Article 4.1 contained the following words. Political dialogue of all areas of mutual interest should be further developed and strengthened between the parties. This will promote gradual convergence on foreign and security matters with the aim of Ukraine's ever deeper involvement into the European security area. This was reiterated in Article 7.1, which called for convergence in foreign affairs, security and defense. Article 10.3 mentioned conflict prevention, crisis management, and military technological cooperation, and went on, the European Defense Agency, EDA, will establish close contact to discuss military capability improvement, including technological questions. Well, I tell you that the reaction to Gorbachev would have been every bit as strong as the reaction to Putin to that. I mean, the whole history of Ukraine and Russia is bound up and this was a highly provocative attempt to intervene where we had decided we would not put NATO. Now, I think that that document, which is now in a small referendum, I mean, say only 32, 3% participated in Holland, has rejected the referendum, posing huge problems now about ratification of this agreement. Because the, uh, despite the shooting down of that aircraft, uh, which affected the Dutch population, it appears the main reason was that they did not want to feel that they were committed to Ukraine even coming into the European Union, let alone into U uh, NATO. And again, you are seeing the people are not following the foreign policy initiatives. And that was an extremely dangerous uh, foreign policy agreement. That agre And why it wasn't rejected in the British Foreign Office I really do not understand. So that is the most concrete, present example of European foreign policy contributing to a very dangerous situation. We are mighty lucky that the Ukraine uh, situation is not stable, but is stabilized. It could have easily got a lot worse than the end outcome. I mean, the uh, annexation of... Uh, Crimea is, is a pretty serious event. And remember, there was a Budapest memorandum in which we went pretty close to guaranteeing the integrity of Ukraine at a time when they were putting their nuclear weapons and their missiles back into the Russian Federation. And anybody who is asked to sign an NPT agreement to not take nuclear weapons will come back to the Ukraine and they'll say, thank you very much. If the Ukraine had held those weapons, they wouldn't have had the annexation of Crimea. And there's a lot of truth in that, too. And Christopher, you may remember at the time our own government, the previous government, was gung-ho for Ukraine to join the NATO uh, organization. There are 1.2 million U people of Ukrainian <coughs> descent in this country. Uh, John Weeks, one of our most distinguished former trade negotiators. Well, thank you, and I'm not going to ask a question actually about trade directly. Well, we'll I'd like to come back to the point that's been made in the discussion um, about how the people over 40 tend to be supporters of Brexit and the people under 40 tend to be in favor of remaining. And is there not some danger here in terms of the older, what, third of the population telling the younger two-thirds of the population how they're going to have to live out the rest of their lives. I mean, I'm closer to your age. We're going to be gone soon. The younger people are going to get older, but they're going to be around for a long time. It strikes me that this is a bit of a, a could potentially be a problem here in terms of, of a rift between generations on this important issue. Well, that problem did exist in Scotland, too. And again, you had the younger people very much more in favor of splitting off from the older people. But I think perhaps quite a lot of those younger people now, looking at their vote after what they've now seen in terms of the economics issue, will be hesitating about that. So if you take where there are differences between young and old, they exist on many things. Um, if I look back to the marijuana debate, for example, 
there was a very, very strong difference of that. Now, you find it pretty hard to find any neurologist who wouldn't say that continued use of marijuana actually does destroy brain cells. And the science of that has become very much clearer. Now, that isn't a way of dealing with the problem, but it's certainly a way of dealing with the facts. And I think that, therefore, you've got to be pretty careful about where you're hand it heading. There is such a thing as wisdom and the cumulative aging of wisdom, and a democracy has always dealt on that issue and accepted that quite a lot of the tough decisions of life are taken by uh, an older age group. Take the decisions which racked NATO in the 80s when the, uh, the movement against nuclear weapons, which was led by the young, and there was no response from Germany when America said that the Soviet deployment of SS-20 had to be faced up to. Helmut Schmidt wanted to face up to it and was ready to do so. And it was Mitterrand who went into that debate and argued in the German Bundestag that we had to be accept Pershing's and cruise missiles as a negotiating lever over SS-20s. But again, there was a huge difference between young and old. I think that was a very important decision in the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union. And so I think that I, I hear you. I feel it. I have three children. I'm certainly lost two. And one, I think, is supporting her dad because he said, but I don't think she'll necessarily vote that way. But I think she feels <laughs> she, she feels she can't, can't leave him alone. Now, I mean, I've wrestled with that one. And I agree it's a very important one. And we have to ask ourselves that when we're in conflict with a generation on a generational question. One last question, please, and then I have one. Hi, uh, my name is Vyas, and thank you for letting me get this opportunity. I'll get right to the question. Uh, it's actually a two-part question. Um, first is, do you think that Angela Merkel should be spending more time trying to convince the Brits to stay in the EU versus trying to appease the Turks? And second part to that question is, do you think that the deal that they came up with the Turks might act as a catalyst uh, in favor for the Brexit movement? Thanks. The question is whether the deal would work out with the Turks. Uh, well, we're in one hell of a jam over this Turkey, a whole issue of how to handle Turkey. I mean, look, for the last four years, I've been arguing for the restructuring of the economic area, the single market. I read a book about it. And I wanted to be able to offer Turkey membership of this because I wanted to keep their one foot in Europe and one foot in the Middle East and effectively support the Ataturk settlement. I didn't believe we could offer them European community membership because I thought we, it was intolerable for public opinion. Suddenly, we have Merkel offering speeded up Turkish membership and the British Prime Minister going along with it. And I thought to myself, this is very dangerous because we know they're not going to live up to it. And this is a generation of politicians now that I have grown used to living alongside that seem quite happy to make public commitments which they know they are not going to live up to. And this is utterly breeds disillusionment. When the Turkish population realize that there is no speeded up entry of the European Union, they'll be all hell let loose. We are now seeing that the um, visa issue, which has been maneuvered out of them because of Turkish help. With, and so we are going to let the, um, uh, this happen. And they will be able to come into every country in Europe except the UK because we're not in the Schengen area. I predict that that uh, visa will be offered because they haven't fulfilled all the conditions, electronic and otherwise. There will be a case where somebody comes in using one of those things who's a bomber. And when that bomb goes off, the explosion against these politicians who have done these cynical deals will be huge. And I think back is really where we are now in where we see the world and the democracy at the moment. Do not underestimate this deep-seated disillusionment with the ruling elite. And do not underestimate 
this cynical way in which they have behaved. There was a constitutional treaty introduced by Giscard d'Estaing in 2004. Blair committed himself to have a referendum on the issue. A referendum was held in France, and it was lost, and it was held in Holland, and it was lost. The ink was very dry on the referendums before the elite decided to get round the referendum and bring the Constitutional Treaty's main uh, recommendations back in the Lisbon Treaty. And suddenly in 2005, Blair said, well, there was no longer any need for a referendum. Cameron becomes leader of the opposition and says he will oppose the Lisbon Treaty. And then when the Lisbon Treaty is ratified, he explains that he didn't mean that he, he only meant that he would oppose it up until ratification. <laughs> the disillusionment in the Conservative Party over that decision the disillusionment in the Labour Party about this was huge. And I did and pick it up at the time, but in my last one is this. Don't believe that the whole of the Labour Party is only on the side of staying in. There is abundant evidence that if Labour had promised a referendum in the last election, they would have won at least nine extra seats. And the 19% of people would have changed their votes in different ways if that commitment had been made. I actually think it was to the honor of the then leader of the party, Ed Miliband. He explained to me. He said, David, I'm perfectly well aware that I may get extra votes if I do this, but it would mean me spending you know, the next two years, the first two years of prime minister, effectively doing what I don't believe is necessary. He doesn't see any need for a referendum. Well, I said to him, good for you. I disagree with you but at least it's an honorable and straight position. So I think we, in all this discourse, use referendum sparingly. A better system of democratic government is the old system that the MP owes his judgment to you and allow them to make judge, judgment decisions, but then accept that the power of patronage and the power of the whips in a parliamentary system has to change. You've seen it in Canada. A prime minister with an absolute majority in parliament, Lord Hailsham called an elective dictatorship. They have far more power than an American president with a healthy vote because they have Congress. The separation of powers means that they've always got a check. When you have a large majority in a parliamentary system, you don't have enough checks and balances and it's not been working very well in Britain over the last 20 or so years. So have a look at that, and I'm glad to see you're also going to look at the voting system. <laughs> so we've all got to look at this whole nexus of questions that are facing us. We are in a global world, but there are lots of dissension and deep dissatisfaction by a disenfranchised section of the population that is living on incomes, with some of which have not changed over the last five to six years, that are seeing their university students and their children leaving university with debts of 50,000 pounds. Our generation never had to pay that. I don't know your educational system. There are too many areas of difference, the capacity to get a house, the capacity to own your own house. Many, many things have changed with this generation underneath us, and we have to look very carefully at the effectiveness of our own democratic systems. But thank you very much indeed for letting me hear, and thank you for the question. Thank you, Lord Owen. I, I, I invite you to come and spend a long period of time in Canada where we have none of these problems. <laughs> Sunny ways in Canada these days. Sunny ways. We have a rock star prime minister. Um, but thank you so much. It's lovely for me personally to see, hear you after all those years. I used to have to listen to your speeches in the British politics in the early 1980s, and they were stirring indeed. So thank you very much. Well, and I want to thank both of you, um, a rock star journalist, for those oh. of us who, who, who read op-eds uh, op um, with great uh, interest each, each morning. Uh, perhaps uh, our leading uh, such writer in the country at this time, and 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 uh, uh, a rock star visitor. 
Um, uh, and I, I hope we've we've uh, provided you, Lord Owen, with a, uh, a reasonable platform. We, we pride ourselves at the Canadian National Council of being a, a safe platform for, for open and safe conversation where we, we really want to hear people's views and, and share. And uh, I think we achieved that tonight, and thank you very much. Thank you.